Good morning, everybody. I'm Danny Jenkins, CEO of Threat Locker. Today, I'm joined by Michael Jenkins, who is our CTO. Uh, we're here to show you some of the new features of Threat Locker, and we appreciate everybody joining us today. I know we've got a lot of partners on the line and uh, customers and uh, and also prospects. So hopefully um, you guys like what you see. Uh, what I'd like to do is we have a, a, a new feature that I'm really excited about showing everybody. But before we get into the new feature, which we're going to show towards the end, I'd like to recap on some of the things we've added over the last few months, because not everybody's aware of the new features that are available in Threat Locker right now. So what I've done is, Michael, uh, thank you for joining us. I'm going to ask, you, ask Michael to show everyone, first of all, the new mobile app. There's been a lot of changes to the mobile app, though. I'm going to hand over to Michael, and he's going to show you some of the cool features we have in the app to begin with. So, Michael, over to you. Thank you, Danny. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to share my screen, because the best way to explain the, the changes is to show them. So if I just share off my phone screen here. OK, so Danny, if you wouldn't mind on your machine, just requesting a file for me. OK, and just probably to start with, we probably want to talk about why we've done some of these changes. We have a, a, a wide range of MSPs and businesses that are using to Outlocker to implement application allow listing. And one of the big challenges is for the smaller MSPs that don't necessarily have a full time help desk, they want to be able to approve things and access their data very quickly while they're roaming about. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to request some a machine here i'm going to be a user and i'm just going to if i can find my downloads and see what i can request so i'm going to trust potty because that's my favorite app as a user and i'm going to hit send request okay so as we can see i've now got a pop-up to say that you've requested access and i can go into that now zoom's just getting in my way a little bit and what you're going to notice is the mobile app has changed quite a lot now. So whereas before we just had the computers page, we now have access to each of the approvals. So if we go into the approvals here, we can see all the requests and we can see the application elevation requests individually. And then. So just, just to explain on the computers page, this was there before, and that allows you to start learning mode on a computer. Um, if you're a local admin and you want, and your user isn't an admin, you want to make them an admin, you can you can check the elevation button and it will make that computer an admin for a certain period of time. That's still there. I know you've done some improvements on that as well to to improve speed, but that that's all as it was before essentially. Yeah, the only major difference on this is obviously now if you actually click on the computer, you can see it separately. Um, this is going to start showing more information as well as a um, future abilities coming with our tray as well. Um, so but, the up arrow there, that essentially makes whoever's logged into that machine at the time as local admin for 59 minutes and they get a top pop up. Oh, elevation control is not enabled on that account. Apparently they get a pop up that says you're. You're not allowed to. Um, oh, so you can now run programs as a local admin. So if you're a local admin and you're worried about keyboard logger being enabled, you don't have to and putting your password in. You don't have to worry about that because the user is just going to be able to do everything as if they were an admin themselves. And then you obviously have learning mode and monitor mode there as well. Yeah, so you can go into the automatics, we can do the monitor only. Uh, very useful if you're a technician at somebody's machine, you can just pop monitor only on, put elevation on, diagnose any issues that they might have any, with any other softwares they're using. So, and then of course you can end them just by clicking and ending as before. And that will also give a pop up on the machine that says, hey, this is going to end in 59 minutes. It'll do a countdown timer and you can hit end at any point from the machine as well. So you don't have to go back into the app. Now, obviously, moving on to the new stuff, when you do get something requested in approval, I just requested access to Putty. Um, you've got options in there now. So first off, obviously, I have direct access to the information I need so I can see the certificates, the hash, the file path all the stuff that you used to see from our approval screen and a button to check virus total. Um, so we can see whether or not we're actually happy with what's being requested and click through virus total. Now, if we are happy with it, we can go ahead and permit that. And you have the same options that you do from the web UI, but there's a, a, a slightly different design just to try and make it a little flow easier and make it a little more useful for you. Um, so at the top, the first thing is whether or not it's a matching application. We can see, obviously, it matches our built-in for Putty. If it doesn't, we can still do the automatics, the installations, or even manually choose rules and add it to existing applications through there. But so if, if, you are it, doing an, if you are doing an update, you can say, 
hey, this is part of an update. I don't need to create any new policies, just add it to my new application. Whatever it may be, or even create a new application. So you still have that functionality. Um, and obviously if it's using a matching, we can pick that matching. We can still add the ring fencing. So if we want to block access putties to PowerShell or command prompt, we can do that from here as well. We can protect our files, block registry, restrict the internet. So we can do everything we do with ring fencing um, all directly here with just a click of a button. And you can see which ones have been added. Um, we can expire the policy. So if you just want, if I just want Danny to have putty for an hour, I can click on an expiration there. It's going to expire in an hour or a day or a week or a month or I can say it's a permanent policy. And then back to that elevation again, uh, we can elevate for, again, limited time, or we can not elevate or elevate indefinitely. So we've got all the options that we're used to seeing, but they're now at the click of our fingers, just touching around and picking whichever one we want. And then the last but not least is applying the policy to the organization level, group level, computer only. So we can apply it to the workstations group. I can pick other groups or an entire org policy. Uh, so for this, I'm just going to do computer level only. So I'll just permit for Danny's computer. Now you'll notice the administrator notes at the bottom. This is the bits that you're used to seeing. If you do want to add into them, you can. So if you want to add in the ticket ID numbers that you're using or any comments, um, I can add in those comments to the administrator notes before I go ahead and actually submit. And then I just go ahead and submit. And now what's happened is that approval has now been processed. Uh, you'll see the policy within our portal under the computer level, as well as the computer um, being able to run Putty now as well. So at the moment, this is supporting elevation and application requests. Uh, you will start seeing more changes in here as well coming very soon. Okay, well, thank you, Michael. Um, moving on to the next cha major change we're having, I'm going to switch back to sharing my screen if I can. Oh, just finally on that, that is available at, uh, on the Android Store, uh, Google Play Store, and the Apple Play Store as well, or Apple App Store that's as well. That. Yeah, that's the fully live version. That isn't the demo version. Uh, we still have our beta version available. So if you want to test the latest features and you're signed up to that, you can still do that. But this is what I've just demonstrated is from the live app store. Um, I, I want to just add another topic in here, which is our cyber hero approval. So cyber hero approvals is something we started uh, really as a, uh, a free feature during 2020 when companies were struggling to get everyone onboarded. Uh, they needed to get these approvals done. So what we did is we extended our support team. Um, so our cyber heroes here work 24 hours a day. So you can actually send your approval requests to our cyber heroes. Um, over the last 18 months, we've really been uh, enhancing that service and trying to figure out how can we streamline it, how we can smooth it and make it a smoother process for everyone. It's something you can add on uh, to your service. So if you don't want to take these approvals, I know the app makes this a lot easier if you're out in the evening, nighttime, and you want to approve something. But if you don't want to approve things or you want us to take care of that for you, we've really enhanced the cybersecurity approvals process over the last few months, and there's new approvals coming. So I just want to talk a couple of things about what we do in Cyber Hero approvals, because often people think, oh, they're just approving something on our behalf. Um, first of all, we every piece of software you request, we run it in our environment. We check every file it installs against various antiviruses, against virus total, and we check that it's got no bad reputation. We review all of the network traffic that is um, created by that net application to see if it's reaching out to the internet, who it's reaching out to. We check what files it's accessing on your system, what registry changes, what startup changes it's making. We review all of this, and then we create a risk association of how risky is this application. We then take your instructions, so if you are using our Cyber Hero instruction, uh, approval service, you can actually dictate what types of software you want to allow. So the, the, the norm is, hey, allow business apps, don't allow games, don't allow remote access tools. But what we'll do is we'll actually take your instructions and we'll review them to see what whether we should allow this or not. So if you have something very generic, like allow business applications to run, but only for 24 hours, we could do that. If you say allow business applications to run for everyone, 
permanently, we can do that as well. If you said something like only allow remote access tools that are already existing and we're trying to update. So if you only allow connect by screen connect, we'll make sure that that continues to operate smoothly, but we won't allow new remote access tools. So we take all that data we find, we cross-reference it with your instructions, and then we approve or decline it uh, based on that. Over the last few weeks, we've really been enhancing our speed, our performance on that. We've been giving uh, arming our engineers with tools to make the approval process faster uh, so we can get those approvals done within a few minutes. Literally in the last two months, our average turnaround time is now down to about three or four minutes. Um, you know, some of the longer programs that require big installs take longer, but we've really got that much, much faster over the last few months. The other areas that we've added to the Cyber Heroes approvals or we're adding in the next release is the ability to request from the approval center. So if you don't want to give all of your engineers right access to the portal, but you want them to be able to review denies and request us to review them, you can actually go in directly and you'll be able to create that request from there and that will go to our cyber hero approvals as well that has the added benefit in that we can see that there's business approval there as well so we're just going to do the network checks the other reviews alongside it one of the things we want to talk about was agent fatigue um security is becoming a nightmare we need more and more agents to protect our endpoints and our servers uh, threat locker has worked heavily over the last few years to add the components and the features so you don't need other agents on your machine and we, we continue to do that so you you're using less agents on your machine but one of the areas we've really focused on is trying to reduce performance impact and user impact on our agent. Now, typically, we've always loaded everything into RAM to keep it very quick. We've used very fast methods of, of, of querying data so users don't experience a slowdown in applications running. But as companies get bigger, as more things appear on our agent, ThreatLocker, each agent is processing some, well, it was averaging about 2,500 rows of data an hour being collected. We're now with NAC enabled, we're now averaging uh, about 6,000 rows of data a day, sorry, a day per aid endpoint. So the amount of data we're collecting, the amount of areas we're touching on the system is constantly increasing. And that means the policies are increasing. Bigger organizations often have a lot of policies. So what we've really wanted to do is reduce the amount of footprint that Threat Locker has on your endpoints. Because for us, it's very important that we constantly improve, we constantly reduce utilization. So there's new changes which are coming in 7.6. This goes into beta next week, and it's going to make quite a big difference to your agents and to the footprint on the system. First of all, in a normal environment, we're going to reduce the memory usage by over 70%. And this doesn't impact speed anywhere. We've managed to store things more efficiently, query things more efficiently, and the memory usage is more than 70% on average in your environment. For environments that have large amounts of policies, that's going to be even greater. So if you have lots of applications and lots of policies, you could see even bigger reduction in memory on those policies there. I'm very excited about this because it, it's literally taken us going back to the core of our product, uh, rewriting things that have been written you know, for years and existed for years. And we've really managed to reduce the footprint of memory massively. The first time I uh, opened Threat Lock on my computer the other day and I saw we're using 50 mega RAM, uh, in, in one case, I was like, is there something wrong? Is it not working? Uh, so that was really exciting as well. So uh, the other area is reducing the CPU uh, usage because by the way, it was actually really easy to reduce the memory usage at the cost of CPU. Um, because you can <laughs> you can iterate through things in different ways and that makes things very, very expensive on the CPU. But we've actually, while reducing our memory, have managed to reduce the CPU utilization of Threat Locker by over 50%. And a lot of that comes down to the next stage as well, which is reducing the bandwidth utilization on the endpoint. Up until now, Threat Locker has always downloaded policy sets in completion. So when you deploy policies, when you permit new software, you now have a new set of policies on your computer. Um, so ThreatLocker's agent will say, hey, I need to go off and get this new version of ThreatLocker uh, policies, and it will download them. They no longer have to do that. Our policies are now downloading incrementally. So it, we have in our, in our lab environments, in our test environments, in ThreatLocker's internal environment, we've actually managed to reduce the bandwidth utilization. It wasn't high to begin with, but for those in remote areas, we've got clients on cruise ships, we've got clients in very, very remote areas, we've managed to reduce the bandwidth utilization by over 90% on Threat Locker. And we're very, very excited about that as well. Because not only is it saving you guys bandwidth utilization, it's going to help with policy deployment times. Because if you had a slow internet connection, and you had to download your entire policy set, even though it was checking within 30 or 60 seconds, it now only has to download the delta of those changes. 
if you're remote. It also makes our data centers perform better, our APIs perform faster, and our UI perform faster as more and more people get onto 7.6. And this goes into beta next week. NAC, I'm going to share my screen for this one because I know we have a lot of clients who are already using NAC. Uh, we have a lot of clients who are not, but I wanted to show you a change on our NAC. And I just want to uh, summarize by what is NAC first. So I'm going to stop sharing that screen and I'm going to reshare my other screen here. I want to talk about what NAC is. NAC is essentially, it's an endpoint firewall. If you think about traditional network access control, you think about, well, how do I secure my environment? from rogue devices coming into my LAN. And I want to start at the LAN level. And the, the way you can do that, if you go and buy a really expensive, old-fashioned NAC solution that runs at the switch, you can create VLANs, you can make sure devices that aren't trusted aren't being able to see your servers. But for most businesses, they cannot afford that, and they do not have the infrastructure or the management capability to implement traditional NAC. So what we decided to do was figure out how can we protect your servers and how can we protect your devices on your LAN without implementing all of that. So what we did essentially, we created an endpoint firewall. Now an endpoint firewall by itself, it's well, that's great, but I can't put an endpoint firewall on my server because then I can't access my server because people come onto the LAN, they want to access their file shares, they want to access Active Directory, and none of this will work because there's no endpoint firewall. So what we did is we created this ability to create dynamic ACLs. So if if I go into my servers group here and I'll, I'll pick servers as an example, I'm just going to create a new policy here. I'm going to say, I'm going to allow, um, uh, I'm just going to say LDAP just as an example. And I'm going to say, this applies to all of my servers, even though you probably only apply this to your Active Directory server, but I'm going to say it's going to apply to all of my servers. And I'm going to say it's going to apply to port 389. And hey, we'll even do, from if I remember rightly, 3268 is the global catalog port, just in case you, um, and I'm going to say, okay, well, this is great. But the problem is if I allow all source addresses, now anyone who comes onto my network can access my Active Directory server. So if I have a printer, um, you know, I, I was connected to my home network six, seven months ago now, and I remember I got home and I could not get my phone working on the network. Now I'm a really technical person, but when it comes to home Wi-Fi and figuring out how to use Netflix, I get really mad and impatient. And I could not get my phone on the home network. What I realized is I have over 254 devices on my home network and my DHCP server was only issuing from a class C. So I was out of space. Now I figured, how do I have 254 devices on my home? Turns out I've got ring cameras, I've got Apple watches, I've got light switches, I've got a 14 year old son, which is even more terrifying. And I'm sharing my home network with all of these devices. The same applies in your office. So you share your office network with your printers, your devices, people bring their own laptops in, they connect their phones to the Wi-Fi, and now your server can be exposed. So Adding, opening this port is going to hurt me because all of my servers can now be accessed by everything on my network. But what I can do is I can actually apply these dynamic ACLs. So I can use IP addresses. So if I want to allow static addresses, you know, my scanner that saves to my network share, I can do that or that queries my directory. I have this I opt option here to use these objects. Now, when I use objects, I can go into here and I can pick individual devices. So I could pick in this case, I'm going to pick um, the workstations group. I can say any computers in my organization can access this. Now, the problem is these have dynamic addresses. So we're going to update the ACL based on their IP address on the LAN automatically as they're issued their address. So when you come in, you plug your laptop in in the morning, whether your file server, you've got an RDP server, whether you've got um, an Active Directory server, we can automatically open up that IP address based on what's issued. And it re-authenticates that every single time it checks in. So all of these cameras and copiers aren't going to be able to see my server. I can also pick individual computers. So if I, if I had a certain user that needed to access a certain financial server, I could access their computer only, and it will do the same thing. It will dynamically update those addresses. So I can create that policy, can allow LDAP, and it's very dynamic. It's incredibly important because I can tell you nearly all ransomware attacks we're seeing that are successful are coming in from rogue devices. So someone on the network, a device we forgot about, that checking computer that someone installed TeamViewer on and to, to manage updates on that you didn't know about is now on your network and can now see your entire network. By using these types of policies, just like a normal firewall, we can have a default deny policy as well. 
we can say all of my, I'm gonna move that down the list. So I'll say, let's put it at 10. These policies run in order. So we're saying we're allowing out LDAP only from trusted workstations and everything else is going to be denied. Now there's something really cool about this. Maybe you don't know what you need to allow today. Um, it may, it's very possible that you've got ports, you've got programs. When you deploy to AtLocker, it's gonna not touch your Windows firewall to begin with. If you don't have any policies in here, it's not going to touch your, your firewall. Um, it's not going to break anything. It's not going to open ports or close ports. What it's going to do is it's going to log all of your network traffic. This is one of the biggest changes we've made to our logging in the last 12 months is we can go into here and we can see all of network traffic. Apparently I've got none. I don't even know if I've got NAC enabled on this machine. Um, we can see all of the network traffic and we can see anything that's going to be denied. So if, the, if you had a deny policy in place uh, or you didn't have a policy in place, it would say this would be denied if you turned on NACs, if you go and put your default deny policy in place, this will be denied. You, it's allowed because we haven't put anything in place, but you can see that and you can simulate it. You can also work with your threat locker solution engineer to help set up those policies. So before you go and lock it down, you can see all of that data in the unified audit here. The other thing is the same applies to your, your workstations. Now, um, I was on a call with a customer a few weeks ago and the, they had a potential attack logged in their Windows event log. Someone's trying to log onto an RDP connection on a home laptop uh, or an engineer's laptop at his house. And what we established is the engineer had opened up RDP on his home, home router so he could connect to his work laptop while he was out and about. Now, this is a big problem for an MSP because if someone gets to your engineer's laptop, that could mean pushing out um, ransomware using your RMM tool and things like this. Now, what we did is they said, they shouldn't be doing that, but we put a policy in place. We're able to put a monitor only policy in place for everyone hitting RDP. And within a few moments, we were able to see all inbound RDP traffic across various different engineers' laptops. And we were able to put that default deny policy in place because the reality is um, you don't need to allow inbound network traffic to laptops in most cases. So we were able to put this policy in place, just deny all inbound traffic, and then the workstations weren't able to receive inbound traffic. A final area, which is, uh, I'll give a use case um, for, is publishing servers on the internet. So if we go back um, 12 months ago, if you wanted to publish services on the internet, you had two choices. One is you opened a port on your firewall. So it could be, I'm gonna open RDP, which would be a really bad idea, or maybe I'm gonna open an RD gateway and I'm going to, um, configure dual factor on it. And then people can connect to that RD gateway from the internet, or maybe I'm gonna open my exchange server or open um, another program. So you could open that port on your firewall and allow the entire world access to that port. And whether you did that or not depended on the security of the port. So something like exchange HTTPS, you may say that's acceptable to have that on the internet. Something like RDP, probably want to go through a gateway. The alternative was you could use a VPN. Now, when Log4j vulnerability came about, uh, last year, this caused a lot of problems because a lot of VPNs were using Log4j, which meant that these VPNs could be exploited of other vulnerabilities in VPNs could be exploited. And now we essentially said, well, we're going to use a VPN because we don't want to publish our server on the internet. Instead, we're going to publish a VPN on the internet and you have to come through the VPN and the VPN has dual factor on it. The problem was those vulnerabilities allowed attackers to get into a lot of networks just by bypassing the VPN. The VPN was open, they exploited it, and that was allowed. Now, in many cases, we didn't need to use a VPN because these services were fine to be on the internet. We just didn't want them to be accessible by everyone. So what you can do with NAC is you, when you publish something on the internet, so let's say you publish an RD gateway on the internet, you can use those same dynamic ACLs. So I'm, gonna, I'm just going to pick, I don't have many machines in this test account, but I'll, I'll say here, I'm going to publish um, RDP on Danny's computer. And I'm going to say, I, you really shouldn't publish RDP ever, but I'm gonna um, I'm gonna publish it anyway. You should use a gateway. You should use dual factor. But I'm just gonna put it on here. It's on my testing machine. But my problem is when I publish this, now anyone in the world can access this, and that's a problem because it means Russia can access it, um, it China can access it, someone you know, in Detroit can access it. You've got it. You've essentially opened your RDP port up or RD gateway up to the entire world. One of the things you can do dynamic, 
with dynamic ACLs, the same thing applies. It's not just internal IP addresses. I can apply certain objects here. If I go home and I say, now I know this is kind of redundant because I'm doing a loop back here, but I could say only Danny's workstation can access this. When I go home, it's going to update that ACL to my home internet address. It's going to update it. If I'm in the office, it's going to update it if I'm at a conference. So the RD gateway is now only open to this one computer based on where it is, and it constantly updates that ACL. I want to give another use case of this. We have a client about 1,500, 2,000 endpoints, and there's a, there's a case study, which I think has been published on this already, um, where they have an um, a RMM server published on the internet. So they have their RMM server published on the internet. Of course, you have to publish your RMM on the internet because you have thousands of agents from different clients checking in, and you need to be able to patch those systems, connect to those systems. And this is a concern because I don't know what their IP addresses are going to be. They're going to change all the time. So before July 4th weekend this year, um, the client wanted to use NAC to harden their environment. So what they did is they, they went um, into NAC, they created a policy that says, I'm going to open up, I'm going to use this as an example, uh, port 443, because that's the port on my, on my server. I'm going to remove RDP here. And I'm going to allow all of my global users. So this global group, for, for those who aren't familiar with it, do I have a global group in here? Apparently I don't, but you can create a global group anyway. So I'm going to allow all of my users to access this across all of my clients as an MSP. So they basically said, I'm going to create a dynamic ACL with the 2000 endpoints that I manage. So my RMM server is no longer accessible from the internet. So if there was a vulnerability in it, like there was July 4th weekend in 2021, it's not going to be able to be exploited because people can't even see it. It's physically not accessible from the internet. So that, and then when they, their clients checked into ThreatLocker, ThreatLocker would update the ACL automatically. So then they could check into the RMM. They could also add their clients office IPs in. So they didn't have to, you know, install ThreatLocker first. They could add the office IPs in for their clients and make sure they could install their agent. And then that would deploy ThreatLocker. But when the people are remote and remote roaming, they could very easily dynamically update those 2000, um, sorry, those 2000 agents IP addresses on the fly. You can do the same with authorization hosts, but this is much more complex than just creating an object policy where you can specify an object. And that could be a group, a global group, an organization, an individual computer, and it will dynamically update those ACLs. Now, uh, I know there's some qu questions coming in the chat and I'm, I'm going to um, take a moment to try and answer some of them. There are a lot of questions here. So if I don't answer your question, I promise you I'm not ignoring you. It's just a lot come in the chat here. So uh, I'm just uh, going to... Stop. I'm working through the chats. I'm answering them via text, Danny. Just oh, you're answering via the chat. So somebody's asked a question here. Um, so uh, Cyber Heroes, this means if a customer wants to install Sage, Lime, Sage 50 upgrade or a previous version, or something other than a patch, Cyber Heroes will approve this on our behalf. I thought Cyber Heroes would just rapid tech support for us. Awesome. Um, what's the turnaround time uh, if someone wants something like a SolidWorks plugin, uh, most recent, uh, will you auto elevate? Uh, so technically, um, actually, I'm not sure about the elevation question, but the turnaround, so Cyber Hero approvals is, Cyber Heroes are there for technical support uh, and that is included in all services. And Cyber Heroes approvals is an extra service. Um, it's a dollar-ish a month. Um, per endpoint and we work 24 hours a day and you can turn it on on a per client basis if um you want something picked up so if if somebody requests a, a sage 50 upgrade and you're as long as the instructions you give you can configure them in the organization's page here let me just check how to do that or i shall share my screen am i still sharing no i'm not uh, I'll go back to the screen here you can essentially say if i'm going to turn on cyber hero so i'll turn it on for this customer here cyber hero management um, I can configure this and I can give instructions on what I want. So um, you can choose where they're going to be escalated to. So if we decide this is outside of the remit, um, so we can say, I'm going to send it to this person, or I'm going to send it to the support desk, any escalations. Um, you can have, uh, this is the default instructions, uh, but you can write anything in here you want. So something like if you use these applications with CSage 50 and would say, yes, we're going to allow Sage 50. Uh, if you said, I only want to allow existing apps, then we would say, okay, Sage 50 isn't there. We're not going to allow it. That's going to get deferred. But you can define your instructions very easily. P they pick up these requests within, well, at three minutes, we start getting very loud beeps on the wall. So, and that doesn't happen very often. So they pick up the request within three minutes. Very rarely they don't. And um, the approval process depends on what they're trying to approve. 
if they're trying to download a Chrome extension for a LastPass and LastPass is considered acceptable, then that would probably be approved within four minutes or three minutes. If they're trying to install an upgrader that's a two gigabyte file, they're going to have to install that program. We're going to have to analyze it. It could take 20 minutes. It depends on what the program is, uh, but they have got a lot faster recently. Uh, somebody asked, is the policy deployment improved? Uh, um, so, uh, and that they've had problems. The policy deployment has been completely rewritten from the ground up. If you've got problems with policy deployment, we need to address the underlying problem. Um, but it, it, it has, it is a complete rewrite from the ground up. So it, it, there's a good chance that if it was related to bandwidth or something struggling, then that problem is going to be resolved. If you've got a different issue, like a firewall is blocking something, then that, that can be handled differently. But please do report it. And if it, if it doesn't get resolved, you just ask for escalation on it. Um, uh, so somebody asked, does NAC recognize if the device is connected to a corporate network? It doesn't recognize if it's connected to a corporate network. What it recognizes is the IP address that you're on the LAN and you're coming from a LAN address. So if you're on the server, you can see this is coming from my local network. Or if it's a if the server is published on the internet, it'll show it's coming from a public address and it'll show you what's happening on there. Um, uh, does it protect against... Um, spoofing like PC names. So somebody's asked, how does dynamic update work? You cannot spoof the PC name. It basically the PC, every PC has an agent on it. So we're checking in, we're using authorization. You'd have to check in from that PC with the authorization. You can't just put a PC name on and say this PC name's allowed. It's literally going out and using the agent on our PC and tracking those IP addresses in real time. Uh, I have one person wondering where they can get one of your t-shirts, Danny. So um, th the best place to get this T-shirt is at Zero Trust World in next year. But if you ask your account manager too, they may send you one. To, um, they have a few. So don't yell at them if they don't send you one because they have a few. But we, um, if, if you didn't get to go to Zero Trust World this year, um, it, it really is a cool event. It's in February uh, every year. It's basically we set up labs. Um, uh, so we have rooms with labs in them. You get to learn how to hack with rubber duckies. We flew a pineapple in, took over the Wi-Fi. We get some great speakers. It's a three-day event in February. And we also have all our latest swag. So these Knacks of the Future t-shirts are being given out there. And we have DeLorean uh, replica from Matt Knack to the Future, back to the future there. So you'll be able to uh, get to sit in the DeLorean and get some pictures and do some other cool stuff as well. Um, I'm going to switch back to the presentation because I will run out of time. And I'm let Michael answer the questions as much as he can on text. Uh, so I'm going to stop sharing again, and I'm going to switch back to my slides. This is an example of it published on the internet. It literally dynamically updates the RD gateway and denies everything else on the fly. Next thing I want to talk about is learning mode and installation mode. I think the most misused products in Threat Locker. <laughs> so I want to explain what they are very quickly, and then I want to explain what's news coming. So the idea of learning mode first is there are is that when you deploy a Threat Locker agent understands what you need or what you're currently using in your environment. So it's not about figuring out what's good. It's about figuring out what does your environment look like today? So you deploy Threat Locker, you deploy uh, our agent, it figures out what's in your environment and it builds a policy set automatically based on that. Now it doesn't permit everything. We have various exclusions. It won't permit things that are on the desktop. Um, when we're doing this implicit learning mode on onboarding, it won't permit things in the documents folder, but it will just learn the bulk of your environment and, and attach those dependencies to different applications. Um, now, before you lock down, you should do what we call a, a simulation or look back period to see, is there anything that was going to be blocked that wasn't learned? So here it's learning for a week. I'm going to let it sit for another week. I'm going to, I'm going to simulate that week. I'm going to see what would have been denied if I was locked down. And that's been like that for a long time. Uh, and if you've got things on the desktop or the documents folder, you're going to see them if they try to run them in that period during that look back period, and you can address them hopefully before you lock down and upset your customer. You've also, if you've also got strange software that we don't track updates for, like some payroll software that's downloading DLLs, we can make those exceptions up front there too. Now, um, outside of the implicit learning, there are two types of learning and installation. There's two other, there's another learning mode and there's installation mode. Now, this is a different type of uh, learning that's explicit. It's, it's not learning generally what's on your system it's learning i'm going to install this new app so i'll take installation mode and i want to track all of the file changes on my system that wouldn't have been allowed and i want to permit them so what it does is it temporarily disables blocking it allows you to deploy an application if it's got 500 files it will catalog those 500 files and it will create a policy for you 
the reason you're supposed to use that is I, I downloaded a new app from the internet. Um, Threat Locker doesn't know what it is. We've never seen it before. It's got 500 files in it. I don't want to have to permit each file one at a time. So I'm going to just use installation mode. Um, learning mode explicit is very, very similar to installation mode. I like to call it ups mode. Uh, and the reason I like to call it ups mode is it's, it generally gets used or should be used when it, somebody forgets to use installation mode. So they, they download that 500 file application, the user requests setup.exe. It does default to installation if it's called setup.exe, but I'll say it's called myapp.exe. Well, it, it comes up to the approval side and you say, permit this application. What's happened is you've now permitted the installer, but you haven't permitted all of the files it's going to create. So it goes and creates 500 files and then the user tries to open it and then the app gets blocked. So what used to happen is the user with the admin would then permit that app, but then a DLL file got blocked and then another DLL file got blocked. So that got really annoying. So what we did is we up, we created this imply, uh, sorry, explicit learning mode, which basically says, turn off blocking, let this program run and figure out what needs to run. It really shouldn't be used very often, explicit learning mode. And the reason it shouldn't be used very often is because you should have used installation mode when you're installing the app or um, it should have been cataloged during the initial uh, learning. So th there isn't many reasons you should use it. Now, I understand it does get used a lot. The only other reason that it could be useful to use it is something like if you had a, a portable app that had lots of dependencies in a documents folder, and I'll use Ubiquity as an example, because that's often installed in the documents folder, and you want to catalog all those jar files and all those DLLs in one go. That's probably the only legitimate reason it should be used. Now, the problem with, with using learning mode in uncontrolled environments is users can do other things and you're learning their behavior. It's only a small period of time. So your, your threat window is open for a little bit, but it's you're potentially learning that and then you have to go and review it afterwards. And the other problem is, is users often don't run the program after you permit it. So a couple of changes here, one of them is coming in the future where you can do program-based triggered learning mode. So it doesn't start until they try and run the setup again. So you're not opening it for an hour now and then coming back later on, but you're going to be able to start it at a certain period of time. But I'm more interested in what we added here today. So what we've done is we've created a testing environment. So, and this is probably the coolest things we've created in a long time in my mind, but, um, I don't write too much code anymore and I got a little bit involved in this one. So I'm, I'm more excited than I am with the stuff Michael does. He can work all day, but <laughs> I know his team does, but I got, I got more involved in this. So what we did is we created this threat locker testing environment. Now I'm not going to talk about it anymore. I'm going to stop sharing there. I'm going to switch screens back. I'm going to show you what this actually looks like. Now this testing environment, and if I can pull back to my computer, uh, it, it goes into beta uh, today. Um, it is not available to everyone. You have to request it. So I'll, I'll tell you up now, if you want to request this, please create an offline ticket because my cyber heroes are going to die if I get 800 people request uh, request this feature right immediately on a, a live chat. Uh, so go into the Threat Locker ticketing system and just request it and they will create it for you. Um, it will be rolling out fully within the next uh, month. Uh, but if you please request it and they, they will work on it. The expectation is, uh, you can see my VDI screen again, Michael, this one. Yeah, Zoom, Zoom's screen. suddenly not telling me which one it's sharing anymore. Uh, so when you request it, the expectation is it could take a few hours. It could take seven days. So don't get too mad if they haven't put it on. Uh, we are, are adding so many people a day onto the beta. So the earlier you request, the earlier you get it. Um, so essentially what happens now is when you go to approve new software. So I'm going to go in, into here and I'm going to request. I haven't allowed this already. I'm going to request this business app 23. I'm going to send this request just like before, when I come into here to approve this new application, um, I have all of the same options as before. Um, and apparently I didn't delete my, thought I'd cleaned up, but hey, let me go and clean up my apps here from my, my previous test to delete anything that's not being used. Go back into my approval center and I'm, gonna, I'm just gonna permit this app here. Oh, well, I'm gonna open it up. Now I've got this request from a user, it's called business app 23. I don't know if it's good or bad, um, so it says it's a business app. They've said, please, or well, they didn't say, please, because I didn't hit please. I can download it. I can view the file history just like before. Big note on this file history. We've made massive improvements on the speed of it. So it's much, much faster than it was. Um, 
but I can also check virus total. So I'm going to check virus total. This has been here for a while. Now here's the problem. Virus total has nothing bad to say against it. So it's it's ran it across 120 antiviruses and it's got nothing bad to say. That doesn't mean it's good. And I really don't know what it is. So I can use this new option called automatically catalog using threat lockers testing environment. And you see this here. And I can create a new application. I'm going to call it business app 23. Now I don't know if this is good or bad at this point. So I again um and i can click here i can say permit uh without any restrictions but before it permits this it does something different so i'm going to say i'm going to assume this is bit good but i'm still going to verify and it's going to open it in this testing environment i'm going to hit save here now what's going to happen is it's going to take me to this screen where it says go to a vdi now immediately in theory this pops up with a vdi and what it does is it downloads the file onto the vdi it literally puts it in the downloads folder here and it has this risk center up here. Now, this is going to give you various insights about the application. Now, I can run the application as if I was the user. So I can click Run Now, or I can go into the Downloads folder, and it ran. Now, what happened when that ran is nothing, as far as I'm concerned. I thought this was a business app. It, it popped up on the screen. It disappeared. What you'll notice here is in the risk center, certain things have started to flag up as alarms. Now, I can expand on this, and I can see more data. Um, the first thing we do is we check all of the files that are created by that installer against virus total. Now, this is a huge benefit because if anyone's tried to buy virus total, it's very expensive. So you can actually test any software in here against virus total, and it's going to give you insights. Now, this file actually went and downloaded EI car on, on the machine. So it's not a real virus, but it, it flagged every alarm in virus total. So that's one thing it did. And it said, we got a problem here. This executable created EI car and it created it in my startup folder. So I've got this concern now that all of this goes red. Now I will tell you, every big program you're gonna install, you're gonna see something go red on here. Uh, it doesn't, like Malwarebytes loves to flag every DLL or lots of programs as bad, but it gives you the ability to actually make an educated decision how many things went red, how many antiviruses, which were they, can I trust them? There's other things we're doing as well. Well, first of all, we're logging all network traffic. So everything that's happening on this machine is network traffic. So I can see good network traffic. It went to virus total. I expected that. I can see it went to Microsoft. We are actually removing this stuff that we know is going to hit from here because it makes it a little bit cleaner. But we can see the machines checking Windows updates. It's doing various things in the background. But we can see everything it did. So if there's any suspicious network traffic, you can see that. We can see any changes it made to your registry. We can see any files that are assigned and we can see a full audit. So the unified audit is actually in here in real time. So everything that's happening is logged. You don't have to look at all this, but it tells you various things and it gives you flags on them. We can also see the new files that's installed. Now this one's important because this is what's gonna tell you what essentially gets learned. So if, you, if I hit end and capture here, this is what's going to get permitted. So I can see all the shards. I can see who it's signed by. I can see any failures that happens the, um, on there. But if I go back to here, we also have this canary option. So on this machine, we've put fake credit card numbers and we've put various amounts of fake data. If this file tries to change any of my data or access my data, it's going to flag this amber or red. So this tried to access my credit data and changed it. So this means this is a suspicious um, file. I can also see any changes it's made to the system. So I can see that it, it tried to write um, to my startup folder. It wrote my test virus. This is actually the EI car to my startup folder. So now something's going to automatically start on my system if I run this business app 23. Now, if this was a good program and it installed 500 files and I, and I didn't see any red lights or there was no concerning red lights, I could hit end and capture here. I wouldn't have to start install mode on the user's computer. I could literally hit end and capture, and it would capture all those files and create that definition for me and allow it. So the user no longer needs install mode. They no longer need learning mode. You, you ran the executable, you allowed it, the problem solved. This is obviously a bad file. So what I can do is I can actually hit discard here. And what's going to happen is this machine is going to revert back in a, in a few minutes. It's going to say, I mean, you can close the window whenever you want, but it's going to tell me to close the window and it'll kick me off in about 10 seconds. Uh, there you go. This is now reverted that machine. Uh, the approval gets undone. It hasn't. It wasn't actually approved, but the policy didn't have any files added to it. Everything gets reversed and nothing happens. Now, if it was a good application, I could have hit permit and it would have approved it and it would have replicated that down to the user's computer. So you get a whole load of insights here 
the, before you go and allow the application to the user. And it, it takes away the ability, the need to use installation mode or to learning mode because you can run this in your own environment. You can say it's good. Now, if it was approved, the next time I went to permit that, it would say, hey, we know what this application is. You've ran this before or you've got a previous definition so you can use that definition. So you don't have to use the VDI every time, but it creates that definition for you. Um, I think um, I'm going to flick back to my slide. I don't know if I've actually got anything else to finish out on. Um, okay, I've still got 36 open questions. Yeah, so uh, is there any questions you want to ask out loud, Michael? Uh, um, well, one that I'd like to comment on, um, uh, there was a couple of comments, obviously, on what you're, you're showing. Um, Zachary said, this is amazing and game changing. I completely agree. Um, and we are also going to get uh, a lot of people asking about the recording of this session. Uh, I'm assuming that's being emailed out, is it, Danny? Um, yes, uh, to say it's recording, so it'll be emailed out for the recording of the session. Um, a couple of things actually are on, on the VDR, the testing environment. The testing environment you can use to test any software. So if you, you just put an approval request in and then uh, go to test it. it um, anyone who's got Threat Locker's full suite right now is not going to be charged, but we're going to add that product in free of charge for anyone who's got the full suite right now. Um, if, you, if you don't, you can, uh, if, you've, if you're on trial and the salespeople have a little bit of leeway for the next few days, uh, but anyone who's got the full suite, we're not going to add it as a new line item for those customers. We don't want to upcharge you. Um, so th that's going to be there. If you, NAC is a, a charge that, that's been around for a while, you may already have it depending on when you sign your agreement. Uh, but you you can talk to your account manager because I can see some answers, some questions about that as well. Um, yeah, We do have uh, more detail on that. About how to get onto the beta of this as well so they can test it. As Danny said before, raise a ticket with support. Do it offline. Um it will take a while to get done anyway. They won't be able to do it while you're on the chat. Um, so just raise it to get offline and they'll all get processed for you. Let me share, I'm going to share my screen just to show everyone how to do that. Um, and the reason I'm saying raise it offline is because the cyber heroes will cry if I don't, because they'll, they'll get very, <laughs> very, very quickly. Um, those of you who've used the cyber heroes, you know that they respond within 60 seconds, um, that, that we may break them if, if, if this happens. Let me just share that screen there. Um, if you are not familiar, you can go into, you can of course, Cyber Hero is the live chat here and you can always start from there, but you can also go into the help desk here and you can open a new ticket and you can just um, put in here that you'd like to get on the, the beta of um, the testing environment, uh, VDIs. It, it's very, very cool. Um, a couple of things to note when you are on it. If the user does not check the box to upload the file, you may not get the option to test it. It's checked by default, so they'd have to actively uncheck it. That doesn't mean you definitely won't get the option. If we have that file on record, you can run it in your environment. What's really cool about this is when they request access, it actually checks if you need to upload the file. So if you've got a two gig SQL downloader, which you probably wouldn't be using for this because we've got a built-in or something for it, or a two gig um, downloader of some file, it's not going to have to upload that file most likely. We have literally terabytes and terabytes of the shards already saved. So it doesn't have to upload. But if it's not there, it'll upload for the user as soon as they hit send. If you ever notice you've gone in here, you've just got a approval request and it doesn't have the download file option, it it may be that you just need to wait another 60 seconds because it hasn't finished uploading because it actually sends the request and then does the upload in the background from the user's computer. So um, I think, is there any other questions, Pretty things you want to add? Any, any major um, questions regarding to that? Um... I don't think so. I think um, so, somebody's asked if it's a sandbox environment. Yes, um, it is completely isolated. Um, so, one person has asked if they'll be able to get access to the VDI without a request, Danny. Um, they won't be able to get access to without a request, but I mean, they could, they could with it, technically they could request it from the audit or it, with the new uh, cyber hero approvals that are coming in because that button's going to say request. From the audit but you'd you you'd have to you'd have to have a request it's worth noting the clipboard is not mapped on the vdi uh, if you ever saw the 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 how we hacked an msp uh presentation at zero trust world you'll you'll understand why the clipboard is not mapped on the vdi so it might sound a little bit awkward when you're on there and you're trying to copy text between it but that's why we copy the file onto the vdi for you so it is very very isolated so it, it's not normal somebody asked on the, about the me normal memory usage of threat locker 
the normal memory usage, there's, there's two things that affect it. There's what's actually being used by Threat Locker, and then there's what Windows is taken. Threat Locker is a .NET application at the service level, not at the driver level. Uh, but the normal use, memory usage on a, a demo environment, the actual usage is probably somewhere about 60 megabytes. Microsoft uses something called the garbage collector, which means it doesn't give memory back all the time if there's no need to give the memory back. Uh, so if you have 32 gig of RAM on your system, it, it I mean, you're, like, whereas before we could have been using 250 meg and it could have taken 600 meg. Um, uh, now you're probably going to see, you know, if you're using, you're not using 250 meg of memory anymore, maybe you're using 60 meg and it's going to take uh, 130 meg or 150 meg because it, when .NET uses memory, it doesn't actually give it back unless it needs to. And that's the way .NET works in Windows. But the actual memory usage is down on the companies that have lots of policies. It is much higher than 70%. On average, it's 70%. Um, the, the perceived memory usage is probably going to be down equally to that as well. Uh, yes, uh, someone's asked, will Threat Locker be doing Datacon? We will be at Datacon, so please come by. I, I'm only there for one day because I've got to fly to um, Amsterdam for an event in Amsterdam as well. But I will be um, speaking at Datacon, so... Uh, and we'll have our whole team, a bunch of our team there as well. So if anyone's looking forward to come by and meet us. Uh, somebody did ask a question about NAC as well. Uh, if you're at a public location, how is it opening the IP address? So NAC is intended to take things off the internet and reduce the number of connections. So if you previously had a server that was on the internet fully, now it's only going to be to the IP addresses. If you're at a public location, that IP address will be opened up. We're not VPNing the tunnel in. We're dynamically creating and opening an ACL. But it's better to have just a few IP addresses open than 4 billion IP addresses open. So it's not, if it's something that you wouldn't or you couldn't publish on the internet normally, then I wouldn't, I wouldn't, still wouldn't change the dynamics on that. But it's, it's only allowing where you are. So if you're at home, it will add your home IP address. Uh, somebody's asked where, how long we're expecting it to beta. We are expecting it to beta for approximately a month, I think you said, Danny. Oh, for the VDI. Yeah, so the VDI, generally speaking, it's about, um, uh, it depends how many people use it, but I suspect a lot. Um, it's about a month, as most betas tend to, before they go into full. Uh, what I would recommend is that, you know, please use it. If there's a bug, just report it in as much detail as possible. Uh, we are finding... Uh, various issues. I mean, the issues that we've had seem to be more that the URL said uh, it opened up, it didn't work, and then you reopened it and it worked fine. Uh, but it's it's running relatively smooth, but it depends on the bugs and how complex they are. But a month is generally what we'd expect. Um, and there's there's no usability issues on it. Our cyber heroes are using it in-house right now. So it it's not unstable from that point of view. But sometimes the biggest issue we see is that URL just doesn't pop up when you uh when you actually try and uh try and open it it just comes up and says please close the window and then if you try again it works immediately afterwards small minor bugs that we're we're working through but yes if you're on the beta obviously um this obviously will work on portal dot uh but we do advise if you're you're testing this that you're better off on the beta dot site so if you're on beta.e or beta.b so somebody asked the question, if the VDI flags it as bad, does we flag that the customers? The VDI doesn't flag it as bad. It flags red warnings. Um, pretty much everything big that you try, you're going to get some warning of. So just because something's red, it doesn't mean exclude it. When you check it against 120 antiviruses, one of those files is going to hit a warning. Um, so we don't, we, we don't focus on what's bad because we deny by default. We focus on what's good. Um, the, we are going to be sharing the data so when our cyber heroes are doing approvals um, and creating catalogs for those installation modes, we will be making that data available for other customers so they don't have to open it and the data pre predetermined in the future. So you don't even have to open the VDI because we can show you the output in real time. But we won't be doing that when customers are doing it because the we don't know that a customer didn't go into Edge and download something while they were on that machine. It is just a Windows machine. There's a couple of restrictions in place, like you can't shut it down. Um, well, it's hard to shut down. Um, so, uh, so it, it make, you know, just to stop you accidentally shutting it down, but ultimately it's a windows machine. Every time you close it, it reverts back to its standard. That's so nice. somebody asked, is it one VDI per org? That's it's not one VDI per org. It's a pool of VDIs that get reverted. Um, priorities go based on, uh, if you're using a VDI already and there's a limited number, you will be in lower priority and 
if 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 there's a massive number it's going to make no difference uh, and they do shut down automatically after an hour so you can't um i think if it's actually you, you can't keep them running uh but the they they are not it's not dedicated per org it's just a pool of vdis that i think we've got 90 something of them in the pool now um that you you'll just come from the queue and if if you're using one already you get lower priority than someone who's not using one uh saying i think that's oil bdis um uh somebody has asked about the summary of questions uh, i believe the you can see the answer questions and they're downloadable with the link um, and obviously any we've answered live, um, you'll see on the recording. And somebody asked if you put a client in learning mode, it, does, is it way that only learns the client and not the company? I assume that means the computer. Um, yes, you can choose. This is learning per computer or learning per company, yeah, learning per app. And anyone who applies to that app, you have various different options when putting someone into learning mode. Um, again, on the VDI side, it's better that it's done for, through the VDI. I recommend if you can run that and install it through the VDI, it takes away the risk from the client. Also, what's cool about this is let's just say I'm going to use something that is a built-in app, so it's not relevant really, but I'll say Notepad++. Say that somebody downloads Notepad++ and it's not a built-in app, it is. You could use the VDI to create the package and then you could allow them to run that program if you're using Elevation as a local admin for the duration of the installation for an hour or the day and then only run as a normal user after that. So um, if it's a built-in app, of course, you don't need to do that. Somebody's just asking if there'll be more sessions like this. We tend to do these sessions generally quarterly, aren't they, Danny? You tend to have a webinar. Yeah, so um, I, I know whenever there's a new product launch, we, we did one for NAC a few months ago, uh, but we try and do them whenever there's something worth doing. Michael does a lot more than me. Uh, but yes, we, we will continue to do new sessions with new features. And what we try and do is just go back over the last few features because quite often they're missed and then focus on the new things as well. Uh, in, in terms of FedRAMP, uh, somebody has asked, uh, are, do we plan to be FedRAMP authorized? We are in the process of going through FedRAMP, but we, we don't actually collect data that requires FedRAMP. We do have clients like the US Navy uh, like defense contractors already, we do fully comply with DFAS and we are DFAS compliant um, and we are SOC 2 type 2. Uh, FedRAM authorized is somewhat complicated because you have to have someone actually sponsor you to do it. You can't just get authorized without someone who needs FedRAM authorization. So, but we're going through the process right now. Okay. Uh, somebody mentioned that we might want to mention Threat Locker University on the new things. Uh, obviously, the university is not massively new. Um, it is there. All of this stuff that we've covered uh, will be in the university as well. There will be a course on the VDIs. If you click that link and you're not signed up, you can just put in your details here. Just a reminder, the password it's asking for is not your threat locker password. It is to set up your account within our university. If you're already signed up, that link will take you straight to the university. Okay, I think that's everything then. Um, and we're, we're about up on time anyway. So um, Michael, thank you uh, today for joining. And everyone, thank you for joining us. We will circulate the recording afterwards. Uh, if you haven't done a demo of Threat Locker already, um, just um, let me check something because I think we've got a coupon. Um, if you're not already a client, so you can get the VDI included, the testing environment included free. So give me one second. I'm going to pull that up and see if you book a demo through. Uh, I'm going to ask um, as well, we have a poll at the end, so Gabby's going to turn that poll on to pop up right now. If you don't mind answering the questions on it, uh, we would appreciate it. So uh, it does help us determine what types of content we should be delivering, uh, but that should be popping up in a moment. But uh, if you, I think we've got a, um, if you book a demo using this code, um, if you're an existing client, you've got the full suite, you're getting, you're getting the testing environments anyway included, but if you book it, we're going to add it on free if it's closed within 30 days, so or I think it's, uh, I don't know if it's 30 days or August, but if you just scan that code now and book that demo. So, you know, I appreciate everyone joining us today. Um, thank you very much and um, enjoy your weekend. Um, thank you, Michael, again. Thank you.